कर्ब साइड एंजल्स I looked at myself briefly in the mirror. It was a simple red silk sari with a gold border, but I looked slender and cheerful, and that would have to do. It wasn't much in comparison to most wedding saris I knew, but ours was just a civil ceremony, so no need for all the bells and whistles. And I'd get a lot more wear out of this than out of an elaborate Banarasi or Kanchipuram silk. It cost infinitely less too, and I didn't have money to just chuck about, so it was entirely suitable on all counts. Plus, who did I need to impress? There'd be only the two of us. Even our witnesses would be the magistrates' clerks who had to be paid for their services. The sari was red; tradition was served. Deepak had opted for a creamy silk kurta. and dhoti with a thin gold edging formally pleated and all and also just as versatile and reusable as my choice we discussed the matter in advance of course there was the minor matter of the wedding photos we could not just turn up in our office clothes i'd ordered very nice flower garlands thick and full bodied in pink and white roses they would cover both our chests most comprehensively and only an extremely nosy person would notice the inadequacies of our dress and not our joyfulness though i admit there's no shortage of extremely nosy people moreover in any case most people would be looking at my face not at anything else and quizically at deepak wondering why such a handsome man should marry someone who looked like me i wondered it myself constantly and frequently so i don't blame them it's quite a normal reaction i've asked deepak so many times and ridden rough shot over his ridiculous reply that my face was not the whole of me that he's now forbidden me from asking again and so when the thought resurfaces i have to just swallow it whole i've had this face my whole life and still i avoid the mirror I can't understand why anyone would choose to wake up and see it first thing every morning. That's just crazy. I have a hideous birthmark, you see. It's very engagingly called a port wine stain. But it's nothing near as high class as that. It's massive and ugly and red and puckers half my face. It emerges from my hairline above my left brow near my temple. it crosses over the top of that brow and the top of my nose proceeding diagonally over half my right cheek passing under my right ear and disappearing into my hairline again it also covers half my head under the hair but that's not much of a bother and if that's not enough it has moods sometimes it's quiescent and pale pink sometimes it's angry and splotchy red it's triggered by emotions hormones food weather anything it takes its mind to it's a monster i've shared my whole life with doesn't help matters that everyone i meet strangers i see in the street all are normal and unmarked plastic surgery is not an option the monster is too large covering eyes nose ears not to mention that it would cost an exorbitant sum We couldn't afford a personalized fitted mask which I lusted for after I heard about the phantom of the opera so I used a veil initially it was cumbersome and I was an overactive child so I flung it aside one fateful day and that was the end of that I would take whatever came no one played with me anyway I played ball climbed trees flew kites cycled about everything on my own I read books and created whole dramas for which i sang and danced and played all the parts including that of the beautiful princess i had still have 
an extremely fertile mind. My imagination is something I could always safely dive into and disappear. With my gregarious personality, sales would have been ideal for me. But I cautiously opted for software. The computer doesn't cringe and avert its gaze or stare or ask intrusive personal questions. Lunch times were spent safely at my desk rather than in the open canteen. I didn't encourage approach and people kept their distance, pointing unsubtly and whispering from afar. I learned to live with that and to be grateful I had a stimulating and interesting job. I am damn good at my work and I have earned every promotion ten times over. But socially, I am a liability as we have already established. And I am so reclusive that I am not manager potential. In terms of skill, I should have had it years ago. But, well, one must play the best one can with the cards one's been dealt. That's my life theory. Deepak entered my cubby by mistake. He was looking for someone else, got lost and stopped in to ask for directions. I never have drop-ins. So I looked up in surprise and inadvertently turned to face him and immediately noticed that he didn't react. It was so stunning that I detained him with unnecessary questions and elaborate directions, basically testing him. Not a flinch. He did his own investigations and came back a few days later, deliberately this time. After that, he often dropped in, whenever he was in my section of the office. He was the closest thing to a friend I had and I didn't really know how to manage the relationship. I had no experience. I noticed his eyes never shrank from my face, never skittered here and there across it, never tried too obviously to look or not to look at it. It was as if he simply didn't see the monster. One day he messaged me, asking me to meet him in the canteen at lunch. I declined politely. He apologized immediately, said he'd just assumed I'd be free in the lunch break. I admitted I was free. Then why don't you come, he charged me. Hadn't he noticed I never came to the canteen, I asked. I ate in my room, alone. In only minutes, he was barging into my cubicle. He was black-faced and evidently furious. I jumped up. Sit down, I exclaimed, and have some water. What on earth has made you so mad? Deepak is the most even-tempered of men. I know him much better now, but even then, I'd figured that much out. You, he said, between clenched teeth. I? What have I done? I haven't done anything. I protested my innocence. Why didn't I come down to the canteen? He wanted to know, holding my eyes fiercely with his own. I plunked down in my chair, the breath pouring noisily out of me. Deepak, your own self-control is phenomenal and you've never indicated by so much as a flicker that you see anything crazy about my face. But even you must surely see the monster sitting on it. He leaned across the desk and grabbed me by my shoulders. I'd never seen a person so angry in my life. You are more than just your face! He staggered out through his clenched teeth. Twenty-eight years of hiding and skulking and seeking the shadows is not easily tossed aside. But Deepak was immovable. He argued more angrily than anything I'd ever heard. He was passionate and furious and kind and sweet and incredibly stupid and indomitable. So finally, I gave in and told him I'd come once, but he better be prepared for the result. I don't know what he did for he has always maintained he did nothing. But I know that can't possibly be true. I got a few long-distance waves and thumbs-ups, and one or two people walked by our table saying, 
Good to see you here, Roshni. But most just went on with their lives. I was so keyed up for shame and disaster that I'd have been in tears had it not been for the few gap-mouthed starers who kept things normal for me. My mind ranged over all this as I checked my appearance one more time. I'd considered an old-fashioned hat with a small veil. But it would have looked odd with the sari. And what Deepak would do to me if I arrived wearing that made me almost giggle with horror. I was as ready as I'd ever be. I heard my phone ring and it was Deepak. So I collected my things and the beautiful garlands and ran down the stairs. We travelled in comfortable silence, occasionally exchanging grins. And I took several calming, deep breaths as Deepak patiently eased the car into a narrow slot. Public places were always such a challenge, even with Deepak beside me. I steadied myself for humiliation. He locked the car and we hustled off towards the magistrate's office, hand in hand. At the curb, a little girl, maybe four or five years old, and her granny stood in front of us, also waiting to cross. The granny noticed our clothes and immediately cottoned on. She turned and faced us squarely and raised her right hand to us. Be blessed always and cherish each other forever. And the little girl reached out for my hand and looking me straight in the eye said, You look so beautiful. The lights changed and they crossed the road and left. And Deepak and I just stood there staring after them, me through tear-drenched eyes. Deepak grabbed me by the elbow and hurried me across the road just in time and into the bustle of the magistrate's chambers. It was hot and sweaty and dense with people and loud with chattering. But in my heart, it was spring and flowers bloomed and violins played love songs and sheer joy pulsed like a cool stream through my veins. <laughs>